would you like to learn what Spark is good at? Or how it works under the hood? Or what kind of pitfalls you can face when running it? By the end of this talk, you will not only have an overview of most common Spark use cases, but also understanding of how it works and how you can use this knowledge in order to create better, more performant Spark jobs. My name is Marcin. I'm data engineer at Tantus Data. Uh, at Tantus Data, we do basically everything data related. So from cluster installations through data, uh, data applications architecture and development, training, also supporting of uh, data analysts and data engineer teams. And I have been working on all of this, but on a daily basis I, worked, I work as an architect and data developer. Uh, during this talk, first of all, I'll introduce you to what Spark is. Then we will have an overview of uh, a few common use cases. So some of them will be on a very high level, some of them will be a little bit more detailed. And the idea is that you get an overview what you can use Spark for, whether you can use it in your business, so, so it will be likely that you will find some similarities to what you are doing. Then uh, we will do a little bit of deep dive, so how Spark works under the hood, uh, how certain uh, operations are implemented, and how this knowledge can be useful for you. And at the end, I'll briefly describe the big picture. The big picture, not only from the point of view of technology, but also from the point of view of organization and, um, and so on. So let's get started. Spark is a general engine for distributed data processing. So that means you can express your business logic in one of these languages and Spark will take care of distributing the load, Spark will take care of executing the, uh, the business logic, logic on multiple machines. Spark has streaming and machine learning API, uh, but for, uh, for today we're going to focus on, on the core of Spark. And let's get started with some use cases. So a use case from a client I was helping to, so a mobile app company, and let's simplify it a bit. So we have a mobile app which talks to backend, which writes and reads some data from a SQL database. And now what you would like to do is you would like to improve your application, and you would like to do that by, um, by simply storing events about what a user does. So for instance, you would like to know that he logs into the application, that he clicks a button, that he scrolls through the screen, and so on. And then your analyst can go to, go to the database and tell, oh, this user did not buy the premium subscription, maybe because he never really had an intention, had an intention. maybe he just clicked on the go to premium button by, by mistake and then immediately clicked the uh, go back button. Or maybe the flow was too complex, so the user was actually trying to to work it around and to, to find, find a way to, to pay for the app, but it was too complex for him and eventually he gave up. Or maybe the application has crashed. So these kind of questions your analysts can uh, answer based on, based on the events you store. Also, you can connect some dashboarding system to, uh, to the events. And so far, so good. Your user base grows. You have more analysts, they are running more complex queries, they are running maybe some machine learning models. But at some point, you are doing so well that you have to solve some technical problems. So your database is, is hit by too many events and your analysts are trying to, more, to run more and more complex queries and the queries never really finish, so you have to solve that, and fortunately this is quite well known problem, and there are mm, quite well known solutions for that. So what I'm going to propose is to stop storing the, the events into just 
SQL database. Uh, instead of that, we could store the events to Hadoop. It's a distributed file system. Uh, and then uh, what we could do is we could expose the user, um, we could expose the Spark API to user. So Spark will take care of reading the events from, uh, from Hadoop and distributing the load. So just to give you an idea of what Spark API looks like, this is a sample, uh, sample program. I want to emphasize on this group by max, average, join, select. If you are familiar with SQL, you already get an idea of what this program does. And if you have such kind of API, you can actually express um, all kind of general use cases. So um, reading data from multiple data sources and doing ETL, doing some kind of transformations and, and clean up of the data and storing it into a uh, common, uh, common place. Or calculating the KPIs so you understand how well you are doing with revenue or how well you are doing with acquisition. And many, many other general use cases from simple A-B tests to some maybe complex machine learning models. But I would like to show you a few other more complex and uh, more concrete examples. So an example from a telco client I was working for. Um, we, what we would like to do, we would like to improve telco network. So a telco network is a set of base stations. And as a customer, you go, go around, you get connected from one base station to another, and you get various, various performance, depends on which base station you are connected to, how crowded the base station is, and so on. So if you think about improving this kind of network, Improving this kind of network might mean uh, buying a new new base station, but this is uh, something extremely expensive and you would like to make sure that you spend the money wisely. You want to make sure that, uh, that this kind of improvement will really affect your customers so your customers are happier. And by the end of the day, they are less likely to leave the, the company. So you could do that in four steps. So roughly, first of all, you need to understand your historical, uh, historical performance, the historical performance of the network. And you do that by looking at historical latency, throughput, and so on. And when you, what you need to do is you have to come up with a score for your performance. And then you can use this score in order to define a churn prediction model, so to understand how the network quality affects your customers, how it affects your customers willing to leave the company or willing to stay in the company. Then, since you know uh, the performance characteristics of the new base stations you are about to build, you could simulate how the base station upgrade will affect the score of network performance. And at the end, what you could do, you could, um, you could mix those two. So you could mix the simulated score with the churn prediction model. So you get rough understanding of how improving given base station will affect churn of your customers in the future. So if you look at this, just four steps. All of them are extremely complex. They are extremely complex from the point of view of um, number of operations you would have to do and the num uh, amount of data you would have to process. And this Spark will help you with. But it's also really complex from the point of view of coming up with the right model and knowing the domain and so on. And this is something you have to come up with. So the only thing I could say is to start with something simpler and maybe iterate once it's needed. But even though it's extremely complex, 
this kind of exercise is really valuable for, for your business. If you think about amount of money you are about to spend for the network upgrade, and if you think about amount of money you could gain by improving uh, your churn statistics, in a large telco company it, it, might, be, it might be really significant. And the question is, why am I even talking about this? Because this kind of exercises has been done for, for quite a long time. But the difference, of, uh, difference between using a traditional approach where you move the data to some R server or to mm, analysts machine locally, and when you compare it to, uh, to, to a distributed system like Spark, is that the traditional approach was just taking a sample of the data or some aggregates of the data and that might have caused to this very well uh, known blind men and an elephant problem. So a few blind men are touching an elephant and they get completely different idea about what an elephant is and something similar might happen to your data. But if you work with distributed system like Spark. It will let you analyze all the data at the same time. It will give you faster uh, feedback loop. You can, you can analyze your data faster. Uh, also, when you, when you, do, when you uh, use Spark instead of some extra R server, uh, it, will, it will give you uh, less copies of the data, so it might be important from the point of view of GDPR. It's coming, right? Um, and one more thing I would like to mention is that um, that quite many solutions like um, analyzing graphs, um, page rank, k-means, stuff like that has already been implemented on, Sp on top of Spark, so you don't have to do that from, from scratch. Uh, last use case, uh, a little bit different one, um, which I would like to show you is analyzing and processing geospatial data. So um, imagine you would like to build a map like Google Map, or imagine you are building uh, self-driving cars, so you want to have a map which you 100% rely on, which you can 100% control as well. So if you are building such kind of a map, you most likely will deal with data from really many sources. So for instance, this car which goes around the streets and uh, takes pictures and then you blend it with some artificial intelligence on top of it. Or um, probably you would like to use uh, open source uh, geospatial data repos. You definitely will need an army of editors and they will look at, um, at pictures made from satellites or made from, from airplane and simply draw a map, draw uh, next parts of the map, react for bug reports and so on. And maybe in some countries you don't want to invest yet, so you like to buy the data from vendors, because there are companies who already have uh, good data maps and maybe you would like to blend it together with what you have. And the whole point is that you take so many sources, you blend it together and you create newer, better version of your map and you iterate over it as often as possible. You want to iterate fast. Um, and the, the problem here is not even the amount of data you are dealing with, but the complexity of the operations usually uh, doing stuff like um, spatial, spatial analysis, geospatial analysis is super CPU intensive uh, and you want, to, you want to distribute it because you want more CPU power rather than handling a lot of data. And just to give you an idea of what kind of operations uh, would be required, so for instance, if you are taking uh, data, uh, raw data from multiple sources, you want to make sure that you, you, you don't end up with a hole in the map, so you have to do some stitching. Or you would like to uh, update the map with uh, the brand new coffee houses, which, which has just opened. Or you have an address, but the pickup 
uh, pickup point for this address is too far from from the actual building, from the actual address, and and you would like to update that, and so on. Um, and just to give you an idea of uh, what, uh, how how to actually distribute the uh, this kind of operation, so the very simplistic approach is to split the map into sectors, and then you get to process each sector in different JVM, different CPU, different different machine. So a few uh, takeaways from the uh, from the use cases overview. You can use Spark for um, for all the use cases when you when you want to parallelize the load, either because your data set is massive or because you want to have more CPU power and you want to distribute the computation. Uh, it has SQL-like interface, so it's quite easy for analysts or anybody uh, who, who can do programming to, to start with it. It has also uh, a lower-level API for functional program pro programming and, um, and a few lower-level operations. But enough of use cases. Now I would like to do a deep dive into how Spark actually parallelizes the data and, 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 and the computation, how, how the partitioning works, and also how the caching works. And why would I like to do that? It's because I would like you to have a bit better disaster recovery plan than this. And why am I even talking about disaster recovery plans? Because when I work with clients, I quite often see that people people can really easily express the business business logic, but then they go to a cluster, they run uh, the job on on large data set, and the job either fails or it does not perform as they would expect. And f in order to fix these kind of problems, you really need to understand what is going on under the hood. So the very first thing you need to understand is that um, when you work with either RDD or Data Frame API, those are APIs of Spark, it feels to you that you are working with some local collection, you do some operations like map, flat map, filter, and so on, but the collection is actually distributed, so it's split into multiple partitions, and each partition is likely on different machine. And then, when you think about kind of operations Spark do, it can do very simple ones. So for instance, you have a string record and you would like to make it uppercase. And for this, you just need to read it record by record, so partition by partition. You don't really need to exchange data between multiple partitions. And these kind of operations can, can be pipelined, so it can be done as uh, at one step. And this, this kind of multi multiple operations like that will form a task. So there will be multiple tasks like that, uh, one task per partition. But there are scenarios when it is more complex than that. There are scenarios when you want to group the data by key or you would like to do a join. So you need to exchange data between multiple, multiple partitions. So here we have user ID and event, and you would like to group by user ID. So event one goes to one place, event two goes to another place, and so on. So you exchange data between partitions, so that means network traffic and so on. So from 10,000 feet, the Spark application looks, li looks like the following. The input is a data set partitioned into, uh, into multiple machines. Spark tries to pipeline as many simple operations as possible. Then you request Spark to do operation like join or group by key, so Spark has to shuffle the data. And it starts another stage of simple, simple operations. But eventually, probably you want to do another join, another, another group by key. 
Um, and so we have another shuffle, and shuffle is the one we're going to focus on now. Shuffle is the one which is quite tricky. It involves, uh, um, it vo involves a lot of I.O., and there are many things which could go wrong here. But just to give you uh, an idea of uh, how, uh, how, Sparks, uh, Spar how Spark creates tasks and how it splits the load, Let's start with the simplest scenario ever. So, uh, we would like to read a data frame of uh, a data set of events, and what we would like to do, we would like to get timestamp column, and out of this timestamp column, we would like to calculate some extra uh, extra values. So, the day, the month, and the year the event can ha uh, happened at. And then you would like to create an extra column for each of uh, these values. And by the end of the day, we'd like to store the result to disk. And the way Spark does it, it reads one block from HDFS. It does its calculation just as, uh, at one go. And it writes the data to HDFS. So now, how many of them do we have? How many of tasks? Let's say we have 10 terabytes of data, or oh sorry, one terabyte of data in 1,000 files. Each file is eight blocks, means 8,000 blocks, means 8,000 tasks. One task per block. So 8,000 tasks like that. You see there is no arrows between tasks. Those tasks are completely independent, so super easy to, to parallelize. Okay, so now we can look at something a little... Uh, okay, one, one, more, mo one more thing to mention that uh, these tasks are run in, uh, in JVMs, so you control how many executors you have and how beefy the executors are, so how many CPUs, how much memory. Everything is orchestrated by a driver, and now we are ready to look at something more complex, so how the join is executed in Spark. Let's imagine we have 10 terabytes of events. Each event contains user ID, the user ID who generated the event, and we would like to join it with, uh, with users by the user ID. So what a single task will do, it will read data from HDFS, it will read one block, and then it will split the data based on the user ID. So for each group of user IDs, you, it, will, it will create a bucket and it will store it to local disk. So bucket one is responsible for certain group of uh, user IDs. Bucket two is responsible for another group of user IDs, and so on. And there are many tasks like that they all do exactly the same, so they are doing kind of pre-grouping. And once they finish, Spark can create another set of tasks. So this task is pulling the data for bucket one, and it, it, it does the, uh, the partial join for bucket one. Same for bucket two, and so on. And now the question is, how many tasks like this will we have. This is controlled by this parameter and the default vari value is 200. So we'll have 200 tasks performing the partial join. So what, what is the problem with that? If you do quick back of the envelope calculation, we have 10 terabytes of events and 200 tasks, which means 50 gigs per task. So each task will get 50 gigs, and remember, this is a JVM. So what Spark will do, it will I either recover by spilling the data to disk, so it will have to, have to do quite a lot of spilling and then external sort and so on, or you will see one of these problems, timeouts, garbage collection problems, out of memory, or any kind of problem which, which on, on the surface does not really relate to the, to the business problem you are trying to solve but still you have to deal with them. So in this scenario, it is 
very simple to recover. You just control the level of parallelism. Depends on the API you are using. You just increase the number of, of tasks. So each task will get less data, and we are fine. But it is not always like that. And now we can look at a uh, skew join example. We still have 10 terabytes of events, but one of the user has produced a lot of events. It has produ uh, he has produced one terabytes of events. The others are uniformly distributed. So the way it will be per performed is exactly the same as previously. The only difference is that one of the executors will pull one, will try to pull one terabyte of data, because simply that's how it's implemented in Spark. That's how the join is implemented. If you are joining by a uh, given key, all the records with that key get pulled to um, to the same place, and that is definitely a problem. That is definitely going to fail. So you have to do something with this. So the first question is, why do I have this queue? Maybe the data is bad. Maybe the, the ingestion process is, is doing something funky. It's, it creates, uh, it creates uh, a lot of records with null ID, and then I end up with this problem. So that means you have to just solve the ingestion problem. Or maybe the input data is correct, but then Somewhere in your logic, when you process the, the, the records, you introduce some, so, some problem, and that's where the skew is coming from. So again, you have to fix that. But sometimes the skew is just OK. The skew, your data just looks like that, and you still would like to perform the join. So what do you do? On the left-hand side, we have events. Um, with and, and the user ID one is the, the common one, the, the, the one we would like to split. And on the right hand side, we have users. When we do join, the user ID one is going to the same place. So, what we could do, we could introduce a salt, so some randomness in your data. Um, so, we generate um, an a, a random random number for each row, random number here from one to three. And for users, we actually duplicate the rows. So we create a user with each possible salt value. And when you join now, you don't join only by user ID, you join on, uh, also by salt. So then some of the users with salt one will go to one executor. Some of them will go to another one, and some of them, SALT3, will go to another place. And this way you unload this one executor, this way you split, uh, split your load into, into multiple of them. You don't have the bottleneck anymore. So once again, in order to fix these kind of problems, you need to understand where it's coming from. But but if if your data is really like that, salting will help you. And this might sound like us a little bit artificial problem to you, but this is something I can see very 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 often. So um, you can see many different problems with Spark with Hadoop, but this one is quite common. So this is a nice nice trick to have in your bag of tricks, let's say. OK, one, uh, one more uh, technique, uh, which, is, uh, which is very common in Spark, is caching. And I would like to very quickly introduce you to this one. So um, you have to know that when Spark does its operations, it never stores the intermediate result to disk. So it tries to pipeline as many operations as possible. And it does them at one go. But that means when you do the same operation twice, you have not stored anything to disk. That means you have to recalculate that. And that is completely fine in many cases, because maybe the calculation is cheap. But in some scenarios, you would like to avoid that. And that's where you use a caching mechanism. So here, the blue operations are reused twice. And there will be 
executed twice unless you tell Spark to cache the values. But you have to do that explicitly. And to give you an idea of when caching is, is a big deal, uh, let's say we are doing a page rank algorithm. So we simply join links with uh, current, current ranking value for those links. And we do that over and over again. So we keep reusing the same links. We calculate the new ranks. And if we don't use caching, we read the data from this over and over again. And as you can see, if you use caching, if you read the links from memory, uh, that's, that's a big win. So it's usually a big win for all kinds of iterative algorithms. Um, so th there are a couple of things you have to, you have to remember when, when you're deciding for, uh, for caching. Of course, when you see a branch in your execution plan, that's a candidate for caching. But when you plan your caching strategies, when you are about to cache multiple data sets, you really need to understand how large they are and how heavy the computation of them is. Because in Spark, you cannot really pin an RDD into memory or a data frame into, into memory. The, the algorithm is just LRU. So that means if you have cached something and then you request Spark to cache something else, you might lose what you have previously cached. And you have to be smart about it. So you have to, you have to understand what, what's expensive to calculate, what is important to keep in memory, and don't, uh, don't overuse the, the, the memory, because you might lose something which is more important for you. There are tons of other gotchas, which we don't have time for now. I would be really happy to discuss them later on. So reach out to me if you uh, if you want to talk of any of these. Um, and since uh, and since you are uh, on this talk, probably you have some some large data sets you you would like to you would like to crunch. And Spark is one thing. There are many many other tools for various stuff, and there are tons of challenges you, you can face from simple ones like what data format you would like to choose, or how to version your data, or how to schedule your jobs, how to monitor it, and how to um, figure out that you have some anomaly detections, and then how to deal with machine learning models, how to, uh, how to manage them. And there are tons of tools in the big data landscape. This is 2017, so it's probably even bigger now. And what I, the only thing I would like to say, be smart about it. Communicate with your team. Make sure you don't have three tools for the same stuff. Make sure you don't introduce next tool once, once you already have some tools which, which are good enough. So be smart about it. And communicate with your team. Share the common knowledge, common practices, like, the, for instance, the salting. But on the other hand, try to organize the work in a way that analysts and, and the business are not really exposed to problems with, I don't know, JVM. Um, make sure uh, this is in the DevOps or, or developers' hands. The last picture I would like to show you today is a hierarchy of needs in the data science. So nowadays, everyone wants to do AI, machine learning, stuff like that. And of course, you can, you can do that on top of some data you brought in a suitcase like once, and, and that's a nice POC. But if you want to get benefit from your data on a daily basis, you have to focus on the uh, bottom parts of the, of the triangle first. So make sure that the ingestion, the ingestion um, is bringing you the good data, the quality of the data is good, that you monitor it, and so on. And from that point, you can go for something more complex. You can do A-B testing, machine learning, deep learning, stuff like that. So uh, the key bullet points would be that Spark can help you with processing data at scale, with distributing the load. That's for sure. But also, for sure, you have to have some understanding of how it works in order to 
in order to uh, write efficient Spark jobs in order to avoid frustration, basically. Uh, and think about the big picture, think about the bottom of the triangle from day one, uh, and that will really, really pay off. Okay, I will be happy to answer your questions now. I have posted the presentation on my my Twitter account. Follow me, so uh, I already have a draft of uh, des describing uh, what I have described here. So if you want to get back to it, if you want to read about it, I'll, I'll post it soon. And now, yeah, I'm happy to take some questions. Oh, yeah. So first of all, thank you for a really interesting presentation. It was quite useful. Uh, in one of the slides, uh, there was a thought that uh, Spark is compliant to GPDR because it doesn't store additional copy of data. But uh, we are relying on data from HDFS, which replicates this data. So what's the difference? So, um so, so I did not mean to say that Spark is compliant with GDPR because it's much complex. I'm trying to get back to the slide, but it's... All I'm saying is that when you... I was comparing using Spark, so you process data close to HDFS on top of Spark. I was comparing it to this, so... I was comparing it to an analyst who is taking the data to his machine, or I was comp uh, comparing it to, 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 to some extra R server, which is somewhere on the side. So the, the difference is that when you do this, you have one extra place where you store the data, so you have to keep track on, on this, you have to report that for, for the GDPR purposes, you have to make sure that not too many people have access to it, and so on. So, so that is the only difference. But Spark itself is not a storage system, Spark itself is a processing system, so if you are doing that on top of HDFS, sure, your HDFS has to have certain layers for GDPR, has to have uh, certain access rules, and that you cannot avoid. The, the only thing is that, that if you if you're processing data close to cl close to the data, as you do with Spark, you don't end up with extra copies. If you have to then manage and uh, make sure it's secure for the GDPR purposes. Okay, thank you. We still have some time, right? What's the gain we have when we uh, are storing our data before the processing in, in HDFS compared to the file system? Because there is also using the Spark context, you can reach the text file, for instance. And what's the what's the gain we have in a, in case of speed or something when we use the HDFS as a source? Sorry, can you, can you can you repeat that? I mean, because you can you can use text files, for mm -hmm. instance, in Spark context to to start processing data, but you can also use the HDFS as right. it is. So, what is the gain we have in performance, for instance, when using HDFS? So, from using HDFS, it's not really about the performance, but it's about the scalability. If you use HDFS, you um, you get the the data replication for free. You um, and basically you you can keep much larger data set in one place instead of just relying on some single text file. If you are talking about just single text file stored somewhere locally and this is your old data set, probably you don't need Spark for that. Unless, yeah, probably no. You are familiar with broadcast variables, and what is the difference between cache and broadcast variables? And oh. what to use mm -hmm. broadcast variables? Sure. So, um, cache is something which gets stored on all the nodes in the memory, but it's stored in a partition manner. So, one part of your data is on one on in memory on one of one machine, another part of your data is somewhere else, and so on. Broadcast is something you first pull to the driver and then you send the whole data set everywhere. 
So this is a nice, uh, this could bring you a nice performance improvement if you have some small data set which, which you want to copy everywhere. So, so this way you can avoid shuffling. So let's say you're joining small data set with large one. If you broadcast the, the small one, you don't have to shuffle the, uh, the large one anymore. You don't have to send the large one over, over the network. But I can, I can show you a bit more if you want to, so reach out to me. And the second question, uh, are you familiar with virtualization in Spark? And do you recommend this in your uh, production environment? So are you I mean Docker or VMware or something like that? No, I have, I have not worked on with uh, Kubernetes and Spark, but there is, uh, and I don't think many companies have done that because uh, recently, it was just recently that in Spark 2.3, they have uh, brought the Kubernetes support, so you could you could use that instead of Yarn, which is different resource manager. It is possible. I don't have much experience with that. Okay, thank you.